Welcome everyone. This is a special edition of our Wednesday morning webinar series. We have Deborah Kaplan and she's she's got books and she's going to tell you more about that. But today's topic is trust, love and money, building financial intimacy and relationships. And she is well versed in this. I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about how why she's so uh, well versed in this. Um, but I, I really hope you take in the complexities of both money issues and sex addiction and how things get intertwined, you know, the, the betrayal for, for all of that. So I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to let Deborah tell you more about her. And I don't have a copy of your book, so you're going to have to hold it up and show everyone yourself. So, <laughs> Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. And to all the listeners and viewers who will be uh, watching on demand, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Tammy. I'm sorry for anyone who came in um, at a different hour or a different time that it was uh, advertised. I apologize for that. I, um, I did what I was told. So uh, we, we did the best we could. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I really love talking and speaking and teaching on the topic of sex, money, and power. But today, what we're really kind of addressing is the issue of sex, but money and trust and love and relationship because beyond relationships wherein there has been a sexual betrayal, couples argue about money. Well, they'll argue about money, whether there's been a sexual betrayal, they argue, and we all do, it has been researched time and again, and that surveys have shown time and again, that money is what most people argue about. A study on CNBC came out just in 2020 in January that said, 40% of couples keep money secrets. That's to say purchases, expenditures. Um, I remember interviewing my mother for the book, Battle of the Titans, Mastering the Forces of Sex, Money, and Power in Relationship. And I remember saying to her, you know, did dad know all these things you bought? She would buy clothing and, and things and it would, they, they were stuffed into closets. And he really never knew until he paid the bills. And then there was this big argument about why did you buy this and why did you buy that and all that. Okay, that's on the very minor benign level of secrets. Trust and money can go so to the extent where there is um, bank accounts, where there's been expenditures that are uh, depleting bank accounts or retirement accounts that are being used. And with infidelity, that gets even more potentially dangerous and um, uh, bet betraying. And the infidelity can be extensive far beyond the sexual infidelity. But let's talk a little bit about where we want to flex today, which is about sex and intimacy and trust. You know, we, we grow up in our families of origin and we're told the facts of life. We're told how the world works. We're implicitly or explicitly given these messages. But I wanna ask you all who are viewing, whether you're viewing live today with us or you're going to view, how much did you learn about money? What were you told? What were you explicitly taught? What were you taught about how to handle money? What money means? what we feel about money, there are cultural and family influences that really go a long way to inform us and help us understand the meaning of money. Money has a huge emotional life behind just a, a dollar bill or whatever the currency is. So what it means to me, for example, and what it might mean to my partner are not necessarily the same thing. And so let's talk a little bit about how do we build trust? Let's, let's first begin with, is there a breach of trust in a relationship? Two people often get together, and I will tell you as a therapist um, working with couples that rarely do couples get together and discuss, hey, what are we gonna do about our money? Will we bring our bank accounts together? Will we blend our finances? Do I tell you everything about my finances? And do you know everything about my finances? Most couples do not discuss these aspects of relationship until they are actually in a committed relationship or they're married and issues come to the fore 
and there is no real discussion on how do we navigate these problems, which is what the first point I want to stress today. If you're listening and you happen to be listening with a partner or you're on your own and or if you are in relationship, I want you to consider how much does my partner know about the money in my life? Do they know about my bank accounts? Do they know about how much I've saved? Hopefully many of you will go, oh yeah, this is easy. We've, we've done this. We talk about it. No, no harm. All good. And then there will be others who say, you know, I've never shared this with my partner. My partner does not know how I feel about saving or spending. We talk about we want to be prudent with our money. We talk about that we want to save for retirement, that we want to go and do these things in our life once we raise the kids or we, our careers are established. But couples rarely sit down and talk about what does this mean to you and what does this mean to me? And the first, um, second order I'd like to bring to your attention is if you have shared how you feel about your bank account, your money, do you have a plan on what that looks like for both of us? Uh, our family of origin, the family in which we were raised is different for everybody. Clearly, that's an obvious. What I may learn in my family is different than what my partner may learn in their family. And the meaning of what money is, is very different. I want to uh, invite you to think about what is called a money script. A money script are the unconscious, often unconscious messages or beliefs that we carry with us about money. The beliefs that we are told can be implicit, we just kind of know it because it's lived and modeled, or it can be explicit. It's literally told to us, concretely stated, that you should never spend more than you have, or the explicit message that you don't deserve to enjoy your life until you've worked hard for it. There are some many explicit messages, but many implicit. These messages are carried along intergenerationally <clears throat> and we bring them with us into our relationships. I'd like you to take a moment and kind of think to yourself, what are my money scripts? What are the unconscious beliefs and drivers to my relationship in money with money? Arguments, as we know, are inevitable. And couples, as we know, argue about money. In truth, what couples argue about is what money means. I can have an argument with my partner and we can be discussing, I thought we were going to go on this trip and I thought we were going to spend X amount of money. Why are we now spending more money? Says my partner, well, well, what's the difference? We're going anyway. It's only another couple of hundreds or it's another couple of thousands. What's the big deal? Well, because that's not what we talked about. What might be happening for me is that my belief in something happening the way it should is that I may be carrying some internal message, a money script that I have to trust my partner when my partner does things that I'm not yet aware of, or I'm caught off, off guard, that that brings up some earlier messages about what money means. Perhaps we as a couple agree, one of the coupleship will stay home, be with children, raise children, doesn't matter which partner, and that that is the agreement going forward. But the coupleship grows, they end up having children, and all of a sudden, the partner who said, yes, I'm going to stay home, decides, no, I don't want to stay home. I, I want to go pursue a career. And now, all of a sudden, this argument around what does it mean to be home or not be home, the unconscious, unconscious, excuse me, unconscious message that what we agreed on is now no longer true for me. And that I want to fulfill my greatest destiny because that's important to me. What I may share with a partner versus what I now may feel about this arrangement goes a long way to trusting in the relationship. 
I want to pivot. I know we don't have a lot of time and I want to leave a lot of time for questions, but I want to talk about four beliefs about money that are very common. And if you can imagine a quadrant in the, if, as you're viewing it from your screen in the upper left-hand corner, we have scarcity. And in the upper right-hand corner from your viewing perspective, we have deprivation. In the lower uh, left-hand quadrant, we have abundance. And in the lower right quadrant, we have money obsession. Now, this quadrant's really an interesting quadrant, and it's set up specifically this way, and we're going to start with scarcity. If I grew up with scarcity, or if my family really lived in scarcity for reasons that have everything to do with economics or opportunity, then I'm living the life and the perception that I live with a shortage of something. It's I'm living in a state of being short supply. Scarcity is about short supply. It could be money, it could be resources, and it could be time. Growing up in scarcity is a deficit. Now, what I think about that or how I end up living that might be unconscious. I may be always thinking, wow, I grew up with scarcity and today as a, an adult in a relationship, I never want to go without. I may be constantly thinking how I was shortchanged and if in an argument with a loved one, I am feeling, hey, this is not fair. I'm feeling this is, I'm, I'm getting the short end of the stick here. Look at what's getting triggered, the scarcity that I may have grown up with. Now let's talk about deprivation. They sound very similar and in ways they might be, but they have very different drivers to our behavior with money. Deprivation, so this is the upper right-hand corner. It's a state, a, a, a resource that is being withheld something that is taken away, kept perhaps from enjoyment. We talk about emotional deprivation growing up, sexual deprivation, the state of something withheld. So growing up with deprivation, there might be resource, but it's withheld. Love is withheld. Perhaps money is withheld. You can't get, um, I have a, I've worked with clients who have said, you know, I grew up uh, saying in, in, in my childhood, my parents said, you know, whatever you earn is yours. And then when they do earn the money, some of the money has to go toward paying the expenses of the family, or they have to take it and save. Um, whether or not that's fair is not the point here. What's important here is the message that I did earn something and now I'm being deprived of it. So that deprivation is going to be, if left untreated and un, uh, intervened upon, it's going to be a driving essence or a message or a script for this person. Okay, so we talked about, we talked about scarcity and we talked about deprivation. I wanna talk about abundance. Abundance, money abundance really is what it sounds like. Ample availability, something that is plentiful. Money may have been plentiful, resources and availability to financial resources, plentiful. Job, income, spending, all of those aspects of money and work that we know that are plentiful. It is not withheld. We do not have scarcity available. We have an abundance. Sounds lovely. And it is lovely. Not everyone gets that opportunity. And we all have to learn limits. We don't all learn that we can have what we want if we eat to excess, if we spend to excess. Abundance is great, but too much of anything can be detrimental to our health, to the loved one and a relationship. Money obsession. I obsess about money. I may not have it, but I obsess about it. Might be very obsessional because I want what I have, what I don't have or I have a lot, but I want more. 
in my first book for love and money exploring sexual and financial betrayal in relationships i talked about working on wall street where making money certainly wall street is about capitalism and money but there's never enough and everyone has a number on wall street you know we kind of joke around what's your number the number is when will i be satisfied and i ask clients what is your number what at what point will you feel that you can relax settle down and recognize i'm okay that number varies and oftentimes when we define that there is a number and then we hit it somehow magically it goes away it's not enough now it's the next goal post now it's the next uh the, the next conquest or it could be the next project or the next threshold of wealth or abundance or of enough well now i want to revisit scarcity the person who grew up in scarcity remember state of being in the short supply what do you think happens and this is a rhetorical question but do consider what do you think happens when you grow up in scarcity you might be very drawn to obsessing about what you don't have there is nothing like taking something or knowing that is in short supply where we become fixated now if in that sense scarcity is a lack of or a short supply of all you have to do is go hungry and your focus is going to be drawn to how hungry you are when will i eat and it becomes a very narrow focus in life but to compensate for that our brains go towards what would life feel like if i had more because i don't and so the compensation for that psychologically is the focus of i don't have a lot but because we can't live in that sense of not enoughness we are drawn to obsessional thinking around money. I want what I don't have, and that becomes the shiny object. Miraculously in relationships, couples are often drawn to the behavior patterns of the person who uh, exhibits or has what we want. Think of the attachment. Well, I don't want to get involved in attachment styles here, but when we when we're thinking we're not enough, but we're drawn to the person who seems to would complete us, isn't that giving us the lack of what we have internally? So if we grow up in scarcity and are drawn to that obsessional thinking, which is a natural inclination, we might be drawn to the things that we are wanting and perhaps the people who have what we want they are obsessed with it as we are they will help us get what we don't have think of how this shows up in your relationships think of how it shows up in your pursuits of work and finance maybe it's investing i want to invest and i grew up with little so i want to make a lot of money i was listening to a podcast this morning ironically of all days anyone who knows the tim ferris show he was interviewing morgan housel who wrote the psychology of money now this guy is brilliant i may be well read this guy pushes it out of the park and if you have an opportunity to read the psychology of money by morgan housel it really talks about investing it's, it's a very different skew on money not what we're talking about here but the point that i was making is here he is talking about people obsess about money they obsess about how much can i make or how wealthy can I get? But he said that focus is misguided because the focus shouldn't be how much money can I have, how much can I invest, and how, much, how wealthy can I be, is how will my money work for me? That's what's important to know. So from a perspective of scarcity, the person who grows up in scarcity, think of what those money scripts are. What are the money scripts of I grow up with little? So I, I'm not entitled. There's not enough to go around. I uh, life is unfair because uh, everyone has but me. The money obsessional thinking of I want what others have. Think of what your unconscious emotional drivers are if you have grown up in scarcity. Let's revisit deprivation. So to recap where we were, deprivation is something taken away. We're deprived of something. If in a relationship, you grow up 
as a child in that sense of deprivation, it is very often the person who looks towards those who have the abundance. If in a sense of I didn't have enough, I'm drawn to the person who can give that to me, not in a money obsessional way, but in an abundance, someone who has ample availability to plenty, to enough. The deprivation, the emotional deprivation that one may grow up in, or the uh, uh, financial deprivation, may be compensated by being drawn to those who have plenty. But here's a perfect foil in a coupleship, because the arguments that often ensue behind the argument of, I want to save for these kids because we didn't have enough growing up. They were, I was deprived of a good education and I want to save. But they're drawn to the partner who's into and who operates out of abundance. No, let's spend our money. What is it for? It's for the purpose of spending. That's why we work hard. That's why we have this money to spend. And you can begin to understand that in the context of where these two people are coming from, one out of deprivation and one out of the abundance, they're drawn to the other, moth to a flame, and yet the very thing they each seek, the balance for the person in abundance by the person who grew up in deprivation can help balance that, right? But now that balance is restrictive. And the person who grew up in deprivation, who is drawn to the abundance is now, it's out of control. You're spending too much. This isn't right. This is, this is going to be trouble. So the money script for the deprivation is around fear. I am afraid we will go without again. I'm afraid I will lose because very much losing or being deprived is a very difficult task. Now, in context, is, as we are, as we're talking about what the meaning of money is for so many, now you can begin to see in the meaning, in the context in which we were raised, and in the context for which money has its meaning for us, an argument can really be settled and I, I would say quieted or soothed by two people sharing, hey, this is what I knew. This is what I grew up with. This is what life was like for me. This is why when I complain about how much we're spending, it's not that I want to be a killjoy and I want to shut it all down. It's that I'm afraid of losing what we now have. And I grew up being deprived of access to school or access to, to resources. And so I'm afraid I'm coming from that place of fear. The trust and the building of the intimacy occurs around the communication. What the context of life was for me and now please share with me, partner, what is the context about the life you experienced? What did abundance feel like to you? And when I come along and say, hey, no, we got to shut this down because I'm afraid of losing this. Tell me what that feels like for you. The person who grew up in abundance believes there's enough to go around. There will always be enough. And while that may or may not soothe the fear of the person growing up in deprivation, it helps for two people to begin to explain, it isn't that I'm reacting to you. I'm reacting to the scripts that are internal, that are driving my thoughts, that are driving my feelings, and that are driving my behaviors. Uh, I'm in the process of writing another book. I have a wonderful collaborator. I'm so excited about this book. Uh, it's gonna be out this year. We don't even have a title. It is in process. And we're talking about how couples relate to each other and how to build this bridge. So again, this recording is also very timely uh, today because I'm working on this aspect of, of the uh, manuscript right now. Intimacy is about safety. And if I can feel safe sharing with you my partner or sharing with you my loved one, what life means to me, now we get to build a bridge together because I'm not fighting in this corner for this belief and you're fighting in this corner for your belief. We are now aligned together as the coupleship that we are. 
working toward a goal with the understanding of how we each got to this point. Because while we can say in a conversation, yes, we both want to spend the money, we make the money, so we have it to spend, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are coming at it from the same place and that my comfort level, when push comes to shove, will be at the same comfort point as my partner. So it's very important to understand what navigating differences is about. I want to stress a very important point. If partner A wins, that does not mean that partner B loses. We are also biologically primed toward loss aversion. Going without is not something as human beings that we are comfortable with. So I will say that to most people, going without or having to go without is a naturally primed biological um, fear. And if you want to test that, all you have to do is go get in a plane, get into some turbulence. And when the plane starts maybe kind of coming down from turbulence, it's losing a little bit of altitude and then it comes, comes back up. Nobody fears the plane as it rises and as it takes off. It's a very natural progression. We're gaining altitude. But the minute we start coming down, there's that loss of security. There you go with a very basic primal loss aversion. Like, why are we losing altitude? This isn't okay. Well, maybe it's because we're descending, because we're going to land, or maybe it's we're hitting turbulence. So think in terms of when there's a loss of money or when I'm fearing that we're going to lose money, this natural inclination that might be a prime a primal uh, aversion toward loss is worth and important to talk about. We, uh, uh, we won't have time to get into this today, but there are some very basic economic principles of cognitive bias that some of us operate with. Loss aversion, uh, fear of um, uh, choice, you know, too much choice. We can't make choices, so it's choice paralysis. Uh, there are many different cognitive biases that go into the meaning of what money and behavioral um, uh, psychology is all about. So I want to uh, stop here for a second, and perhaps there's a question, and if not, I will move into another area, but. There is a question, so we'll, we'll take this one for the moment. So if you have questions, please do type them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. This person wrote, I grew up with very little. Now as an adult, I make good amount of money. I have provided for my family and spent money in my addiction. Now I am recovery. I feel that I don't deserve any money and I'm willing to give all the assets and money to my wife to pay the painful debt of betrayal. Is that a common feeling for an addict trying to repair the damage? Yes, it's very common. And um, I will go on to say that we'll, we'll talk about sexual betrayal or financial betrayal in a minute here, but the, consider that there might be a deprivation mentality operating. If growing up with little and then making a salary or a, a, an income that's comfortable, the deprivation mentality might still be operating in the background. The, the person who may have grown up with very little, but now has a lot, has changed their financial status, but they may still be operating, and it may sound like in this question, that a person's operating from that place of, yeah, but I'm afraid I may lose this. And so I'm still holding on to that very small life that I had, because I know how painful it was to grow up with little, and now I'm aware that I don't want to ever get back to that place. If you put an overlay of betrayal in there, now it almost feeds the, the belief system that I don't deserve to have. And one of the things I say to couples when they come in, I, I do financial intensives, I work with couples. Um, I'm very aware that if a couple comes into money that they did not have, 
I want to make sure as a financial therapist that they have a planner or someone who's going to help them take care of their money because those who have a deprivation mentality will lose it overnight. They will psychologically, unconsciously give it away. I have clients who do this. They come into money or they grew up with money. Sometimes the money script is if I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. So if they've somehow married into money or they've got a windfall of insurance or something, the money ends up disappearing right out from under them because psychologically they don't deserve to have it. They won't feel comfortable keeping it. So it goes away. And my greatest fear for them is that they will literally behave themselves right back into the poverty. So it's a wonderful question. And I hope that just touches some of that. So sorry. I have too many tech systems. Okay, so then there's another question. I, I, I have so many questions just from what you've shared too. So this is probably she's. Oh, you froze. So, Up, oh, you froze. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, it said probably and then it froze, but go for it. Okay. Okay. So the somebody asked if this recording will be posted and it will be posted on sex and relationship healing.com yet today. So, so watch for that. Um, so the next question, and if you're not following along, you can see them if you pop open the Q and a, but you probably already did that. Hi, Deborah. I am, I really resonated with your book and attended seeking integrity and have a year of solid recovery from sex addiction. That is awesome. Part of my addiction was also financial betrayal. I'm successful in my career and my wife is a corporate executive who has more than tripled my salary. And I believe my extremely, it made me extremely proud yet jealous. Part of my infidelity was embezzlement tax and issue insurance fraud to steal money when we not at all needed it or used it for acting out. I want to do further recovery work on my financial part of my addiction. My CSAT is great on the sex part, but not as experienced in this area. Any advice on how to better uh, process this and understand the why, et cetera? Yeah. That's a great oh. question. Thanks for asking. That's an awesome question. Thank you. I don't know who asked it, but I love it. And um, yeah, uh, there's a, there are a number of things um, in this question. So I'm going to take it, take it apart little by little. Uh, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the person's question for saying, hey, I'm a little jealous. There's a power differential in relationships, whether it be by age or uh, academic intellect or by school or social status. You know, we marry for different reasons and hopefully it's for love and it's forever, but there are reasons that two people come together. And at times, based on what the acknowledgement in the coupleship is about, I'll go to work and you'll stay home or you'll, we'll both go to work, but I tend to be more the breadwinner than maybe you tend to be. And when that baseline shifts and the person who was not intending to have made the majority of the money becomes more successful financially, that really does have to be addressed in a relationship because the fact that it is occurring is not a problem. Not discussing it is. There will be power differentials and I've written about that and stated that. I think it's a beautiful, vulnerable position to acknowledge to a partner, I'm feeling insecure. I'm feeling a little bit insecure and jealous that you're making more money than I am or that you're getting more acknowledgement than I'm getting. And I think it's a beautiful way to build the closeness instead of having it become a dividing aspect or issue in the coupleship. So that um, the, really the best way to handle that is to acknowledge oneself of, hey, I'm really feeling jealous and insecure. Uh, I know for me personally, what I do to uh, work through my feelings of insecurity, and it could even be socially or could be with friends. Um, I acknowledge it to myself. I acknowledge that if I'm holding a resentment, that that resentment is about an unmet need in me. And that now gets towards what can my recovery be? That the unmet need is an opportunity for me to do deeper work. I may not know what the unmet need is. It might be that I didn't get acknowledged as a child and here's that wound again coming forward and I'm now not being acknowledged today. Uh, specifically in this question, it was about embezzlement and, and that is a very complex area to get into, shoplifting, kleptomania, 
um, shoplifting is quite, and this is not embezzlement, but um, embezzlement and stealing can be for many reasons that I didn't have the unfairness of life. Uh, notice what the money scripts are. In other words, what is driving my need to steal or what is driving my need to shoplift? Kleptomania is an, um, an anxiety issue. It's a, it's a impulse control issue. Shoplifting is planned. It is uh, acknowledged in advance, and it tends to have to treat the depression because there is a deprivation aspect. People who steal kleptomania, they rarely care about what items they're stealing. It doesn't have the value. It's a getting this impulse, this urge, and to act on it. Shoplifting tends to be righting a wrong from childhood, getting something that I didn't have, righting that wrong and healing that wound. So with um, embezzlement, and there are many complexities to whatever the circumstances will be, I, I really think that looking through what is operating that the unfairness or the belief that is stacked against me, or I need to have this to feel better, there might be a connection between I'm jealous that my wife makes more money and I embezzled uh, both of those operating from a place of, hey, I need to feel more important and I need to be more important. And if I take this money, I will feel more important. And if I'm married to someone that I can't feel this way, how do I compensate? So I'm throwing that out there. It's quite complex, but I hope that maybe touches on this. Well, and, and you know, I, uh, we have more questions, but like, even just with that, I'm thinking, you know, like I, I'm going to feel good, but that doesn't last. It's like everything else with, you know, it's like, yeah, I feel really good for that five seconds, really? but then, really? yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so, means okay. it's an inside out job, not an outside in job. Yeah, totally. So you were just talking about the disparity with couples. The next question alludes to that too. How can a couple share costs when one has greater financial resources than the other? Mm -hmm. Very, very good question. And also, very common. I have really yet to have a couple come into my practice and or work with a couple in, in uh, an intensive where they come in and they say, we are, you know, equal in our income, we're equal in our saving. I mean, that that two by two doesn't happen. That Noah's, uh, the Noah's Ark two by two isn't there. <laughs> but what I do say to them is, here's where you're building the intimacy. The difference is not the problem. Again, the conversation or lack thereof will be. How do we want to navigate the expenses? Do we want to, and, and this kind of goes into financial planning and I'm not uh, espousing or advocating any one way and I'm not even giving advice. But what this involves is how do we as a couple want to go about handling our finances, paying our bills, saving? Do we want to put X percent? I once had a couple who came in and did an intensive, argued bitterly about saving. Um, one could say, well, what were they arguing about when they're both saving? But then the argument really became about we're saving, but we're not saving enough. So the argument was oh. about the spending. Oh. The, in the, in the wife in this case said, we, we were spending X amount of dollars, which made, uh, no, she said, um, yeah, she said, we're spending X amount, of, X amount of dollars. The husband was incredibly fearful because he said, this money is a larger percent of my income than I can oh. feel comfortable with. And so I said, well, wait a second. Are, are, we, are you both saying that you're talking in percent and you're talking in dollars and that this isn't matching up? Is this part of the issue? And it became part of the issue. If we can agree on a percent, now I feel comfortable. So it really is developing a language in your coupleship of what fits for two of you. There is no one way to save. There is no one way to spend. Some couples decide we want a joint account and each of us have our own individual. If there has been sexual betrayal and if there's been financial infidelity within that sexual betrayal, it will be a very long time before a betrayed partner will want their money shared by the person who did the betraying. So, that is going to be a little bit different of a, of a prospect going forward because 
Who's to tell the partner who was betrayed, trust your partner. Trust obviously has to be earned and it's consistent. I've had couples who have done postnups because they have decided, wait a second, I need to know that should you again betray me or have an infidelity, that I will be safe. And so a postnup in that regard is very helpful. It brings the trust to the relationship and that the marriage or the relationship can go forward with a very new understanding and a new rule of engagement to how we will build intimacy back into our connection. So I hope that helps. It, it does help, but I, I'm going like, I mean, if people are able to not even, I know they can come to you and do an, an intensive, but if people are trying to have these conversations, do you recommend that they start with somebody like a professional to help, or do they try to do it themselves and see if they get stuck? Do you have any guidance for how do you even start this? Yeah, thank you for the prompt. That's awesome. Um, I think that couples, some couples can navigate this on their own. I'm a financial therapist. I work with these issues and financial therapy is not about doing budgeting. A financial therapist is not a financial planner and those two should never be by the same person. Oh, by the way, ethically speaking. Mm -hmm. What couples may want is the help of a therapist, a financial therapist and there you can go to financial therapy association. I'm on the board wonderful organization. They do incredible work. I'll be doing a webinar this summer, actually. Not uh, not too dissimilar from this, but different. So we'll advertise that. But um, the work that they do, you could go and find a financial therapist in your area who will work with you. And having a therapist work with you as the coupleship to some of what the money means to you, how you're navigating this, what's important to both of you, what is in the pyramid, their money pyramid, what is in the pyramid? In other words, the most basic needs have we met and or are we at a place where we can actually navigate this because we both feel we can have an expenditure of money and feel comfortable in that. Like anything else, if there's the lack of uh, um, objectivity, in other words, if both couples, uh, both individuals in the couple can have this conversation without finding their corners and fighting for their position, then great, do it on your own. But if you can't, because you need someone to be help you moderate, then that's important. That's very helpful. And I just put, for those of you that are joining live, I put the link for financialtherapyassociation.org in the chat. So you can uh, click on that directly. So I do want to add one of the reasons that this book, I'm writing this book with my collaborator is so that we can give couples a roadmap to say here, this is how you work through it. You'll, if you need help, great, but here's how you do it. If you need that support and that guidance, which most of us do. And um, so I, I'm excited and I don't have it to show, but it's there, it's coming. She's gonna come back and she's gonna share more again, but we're not done yet. So the next question, Deborah, I discovered only last year that my former partner was secretly providing giving money to his ex while he asked me, oh, asked me for money to start a business. I worked for free, helped a lot also, and all the while he was busy behind my back for years. Can you react to this? After so many lies, chances and betrayal, I don't want anything to do with this person anymore. I just cut my losses. Oh. That's so devastating. Oh, that's devastating. And boy, is that painful. And that's incredible. That betrayal, that level of trust that was breached for sure. I'm not, you know, how one works through that. Um, I give you a lot of credit to continue to find that balance and that serenity uh, and acceptance of what was, unless there's something you have from a legal perspective, depending on what, what that is about. But God, that's awfully difficult. And I can imagine how that might impact the ability to trust going forward. If growing up there was a level of trust and betrayal as well, that gets brought, commuted forward because any unresolved traumas around trust or betrayal in the family of origin will only get stirred up. And all of that together has to be addressed, kind of like sweeping the corners for dust bunnies, making mm. sure that if there's any other betrayal that this has triggered to work on so that at least the person whose question this was to bring that level of distress and upset down to a, a moderate level where you can work with it versus having to carry that around 
because it's being fed by unresolved trauma from before. Yeah, yeah, and I, I honor you for being here and owning that too. That that is the layers of trauma as you're uh, explaining. Okay, so the next question: My parents saved money for me, and when I got married, I w had way more money than my husband. He used this to justify his spending in his addiction. I have a lot of resentment from this. He is in good recovery, but his financial betrayal is still very painful. What are some good ways to communicate this? Um, so if to communicate it to him or to-, to I, I believe it's to, that was what I took was to I'm communicate to- I'm gonna take it to, from, yes, from the please. perspective. And, and uh, another good question, because even if it weren't based on this betrayal, a couple should, you know, two people come together where one has more money than the other, how to navigate that as well. But given that this is based on a betrayal, you know, I think that when someone who's in recovery and they're in true looking to uh, kind of center themselves. I, I just had 22 years, my, my recovery birthday was just uh, two weeks ago, recovery 22 years. My favorite step is the 10th step, taking a daily inventory. And when I was wrong, promptly admitted it. It is the most important step for me. And that in righting the wrongs, making amends, an active ninth step, making a financial amends, during the financial, as a result of the financial betrayal, it is not for the betrayed partner to say, hey, this will make a really good amends on your part. Why don't you consider doing this for me? But consider that as a request, when we as a couple now move forward, getting past this betrayal, I'm wishing, I'm hoping, can we please talk about what might help soothe this wound? It might be very simple. It might just be that we put money towards an account that is mine, that I know I have. I've worked with couples who have had sexual infidelity and she's so afraid, in this case I'm thinking, so afraid to trust her husband that she said, I'm too, it wasn't financial infidelity, it was sexual. But in order for me to feel safe in this marriage, I have to know that I have a safe place to land because I grew up without and I don't wanna feel and keep feeling that I will have nothing. So they, she had an account that was hers financially, and they both understood what that was about. It was like a security blanket. She eventually felt comfortable to let it go. But if it serves as that role, such as a security blanket, there may be nothing wrong with that. And if both individuals can get behind that for the benefit of and the trust and intimacy of the relationship, I mean, I can't see it. A, a, a better reason not to do it. But I love that he's in good recovery. I'm so so there's lots of hope and hope for that. So so we have about 12 minutes left. You had more to share. I should I'll turn it back over to you for the next piece. Thank you. So one of the uh as we've touched on in some of these questions, it's very how would I say it's easier to trust partners and be able to move forward when there has been no infidelity. But I do wanna to touch on the aspect of betrayal because betrayal can be so painful, so damaging that to ask of the betrayed partner to trust me now is a high watermark and one that may not be realistic. If in the process of rebuilding trust and intimacy in a relationship, it is the role of the person who has done the betrayal to act in a way that is consistent, transparent, open, compassionate. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Rob wrote out of the doghouse and that's applicable for any relationship, whether it's a sex addiction, compulsivity, or just an affair. And I don't mean just an affair, I mean, but a, an affair that is not a series and a pattern of addiction. And that in that way, the person who has had the affair, it's got to be owned. It does not mean that forever, and this touches back on one of the questions, it does not mean that forever the person who had been doing the financial or the sexual betrayal never stay, have a leg to stand on. At some point, you have to, the betrayer has to forgive themselves. But there's no early victory lap. 
There's no like, whoa, I forgive myself. I'm feeling better and my partner should forgive me too. No early victory laps here. One day at a time, showing up with transparency and with compassion to be open and trustworthy so that on a daily basis, the agenda is not to get your partner, to get my partner to believe me. It's without intention, without agenda, just to do the next right thing one day at a time. And if by chance the partner who was betrayed is open and willing and can build that trust, the intimacy can come and be sewn back into a new version, a new iteration of what this relationship is about. But I really stress that there is no agenda. I don't do the right thing because it will get my betrayed partner to believe me. That's agenda seeking. That is motivated and manipulated, manipulative with the intention of wanting what I want as the outcome. So as a person who may have done the betrayal, that person has to let go of outcome and recognize that your betrayed partner may or may never trust you. But if showing up with intention and compassion is from a heartfelt, earnest place, that in and of itself speaks volumes and will get the coupleship closer to building the trust. Trust is also on a very moderate level breached even if there is the impropriety or the perception, oh my gosh, this person, I'm not sure I can trust them. Now the infidelity may have been around money and it may have been around sex, but now all of a sudden partner shows up, let's say the person who's been doing the betrayal shows up and they're on their phone and the minute the, some, the partner walks in, the, the phone slams down or the laptop comes down. And to the betrayed partner, this is a huge red flag. To the person doing the betraying, they're thinking, I'm not doing anything. I will never be trusted again. There's, there's no hope for this relationship. I'm never going to be able to walk into a room or just be me without having to be under the microscope or the crosshairs of having done something wrong. And I want to really uh, implore anyone who's thinking that because it's a very common belief that I'll never, you know, the future tripping and nothing's ever going to work again to really banish that thought. And it's self-defeating to feel that way because if in the perception of a lie, perception of a deceit, perception of a betrayal, I, my hope would be that the person who is now having to earn trust would be willing and open to do what he or she or they are willing to do to build the intimacy back. Not because I have to, not because I'm being forced into it, not because I don't have a choice or not because I'm being parented into doing it. It's because this is what I want. This is the integrity and how wonderful the seeking integrity, <laughs> the integrity seeking of I want to show up and I want my partner to trust me in this way to shift the orientation of I have to do this versus this is what I would like to do because I want to do it for us. I want to do it for me because my recovery is important. And by so doing that, I want to do it for us. It's a, it's a reorienting. It's a shifting of the value system and the, um, in a way it's turning back to, to the person and not in a selfish way, but it's saying, hey, I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to be accountable and I'm going to show up. And my partner may never trust me, but that is not the purpose. The purpose is to say, I'd like to build trust because I am willing to earn this. And if the roles were reversed, would that not also bring a level of comfort? And wouldn't that bring a level of um safety into the relationship. I think other ways financially um, to touch back on betrayal and also building intimacy in the face or post betrayal. 
what couples decide on, uh, and this is similar to sexual betrayal as well. Couples say, I don't know if I'll ever be able to get back to where we were. And I want to really kind of put a whole new perspective on that. My hope would be you don't get back to that place either. That is not a place I'd love for it to, to see you both in. This is the version 2.0. This is the version of where both of you may have never gotten had it not been for this betrayal to come forward. And that if both of you are looking to work on this relationship or this marriage, and you're looking to do so with the intention to keep showing up until something changes, the person who's been betrayed has to say, okay, I'm willing to be here. I'm not willing to trust you, but I'm willing to show up and watch and earn and, and take it day by day. The person who did the betraying, there's no, she's got to, they have to believe me for me to stay. No, you're both showing up and working toward 2.0 because that is the version that you both are working at now. Banish what was, that relationship is no longer. And while I wouldn't even say it is the relationship you wanted, this gets to be the opportunity that sits before your feet for two people to build and galvanize a stronger, much more intimate connection. In the face of betrayal, that takes time. But I will tell you, it is possible. And it's only possible if both people show up and agree to do what they've agreed to in the first place with this new iteration. That until further notice, I'm gonna trust you because I'm gonna trust myself that I know how to keep myself safe. I know where boundaries are. I know containment and I know protection. And that goes for both individuals in a relationship. So boundaries are really important as two people proceed in a, in a uh, marriage and in working the steps if they're in 12 step recovery. And so I think it's really helpful to remember the new relationship has yet to be really defined we get to define it. It's what we want for ourselves. So um, with that, it's, I, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I love speaking on this topic and I hope there have been some gems and some takeaways. There are so, so much of what you said. Like I said, I've got two pages of notes. And um, so for those of you joining, thank you for joining us live and thank you for asking great questions. I typed in the chat DebraKaplanCounseling.com. You can always email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at Seeking Integrity, and I'll point you in those directions. I am going to beg Deborah to come back. This has been a delight. I, you know, I adore but Deborah on a personal level, and to have an opportunity to be on a Zoom for an hour is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, so we'll do it again, I hope, um, in the not too distant future. So thank you all. The recording will be posted on sexandrelationshiphealing.com today because it's important. So and if the for uh, whatever reason uh, for love and money was written for relationships wherein there has been a sexual betrayal uh, for love and money exploring sexual and financial betrayal relationship and for couples where there has not been betrayal but there are issues around sex money and power uh, battle of the titans mastering the forces of sex money and power in relationship so you can and the books are on booksellers and amazon and yes uh, and they're listed on our website too so yes yes find them but come back. So Thank thanks, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you all.